NTV Television Network presents. The other day, current era, 1962. Translation and voiceover by BMI Russian. Good evening. You're watching episode two of our new series, The Other Day, 1961 to 1991. Events, people, and occurrences which defined a lifestyle. Things that we'd be hard pressed to imagine ourselves without, let alone comprehend. Another year, another episode. Today we will be focusing on the year 1962. This was the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the hula hoop growing meat prices, the first ever Little Light, Ivan Denisovich, Landau winning the Nobel Prize, and the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Berdino. Screenwriter and actress Renata Litvinova, economic expert Yegor Gaidar, political expert Sergei Karaganov. In April of 1962, a new show aired on Central Television called Little Light. New episodes would air on Saturday, 11 p.m., marking the beginning of the only weekend day people would get at the time. Holiday specials were called Little Blue Lights, named after the glow of black and white TV sets. Little Lights became the nation's main pastime. The Little Light studio was set up to resemble a cafe. Creative intellectuals would be invited as guests, and viewers got the opportunity to take a glimpse at celebrities in real life. Little Lights would showcase discussions about ceramics and quantum physics, new songs and fashion shows. Holiday specials would be prepared for November 7th, March 8th, May 1st and 9th, but the most important one was always considered the New Year's special. These episodes would be the culmination of the creative collective monitoring progress in all areas, so that right after midnight they could reveal the most prominent leaders, winners, and performers, and all in one studio. The little blue light was an extension of the holiday table. People would celebrate New Year while closely focusing on the show. Nona Gaprinda Shvili becomes the chess world champion. The college student from Tbilisi defeats two times champion Elizaveta Bykova with a score of nine to two. This marked the beginning of the Georgian era of world-class women's chess, mostly associated with Nona Gaprinda Shvili, Maya Chibordanidze, and Nana Alexandria. 1961 to 1962 was the first academic year when the Council of Ministers' decree on more comprehensive study of foreign language came into effect. The decree obligated schools to divide students studying foreign languages into two groups. Given that the war with Germany ended only 16 years prior, the proportion of foreign language study where most people would study German was deemed irrational. For the first time in Soviet history, English became the most common foreign tongue. Aside from an increase in the network of study courses for adults, foreign language study was also encouraged among children of kindergarten age and older. Children, why don't we listen to Marina recite a poem for us? Preparation of educational programs was commenced, and records with foreign language lessons were produced. The entire world is accustomed to considering 1960 the year of Africa. That was the year when 17 colonies on the Dark Continent gained their independence. For the Soviet Union, this marked the beginning of a period of a few years dedicated to Africa. African affairs were a big part of the agenda during that time. Official visits, rendezvous at the Kremlin, and conferences between delegations would be held one after another. In 1962, the name of the first Prime Minister of the Independent Republic of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, was assigned to Moscow's People's Friendship University. The new higher educational facility was meant to prepare socialist-leaning personnel for third world countries. Aerial communication between Moscow and the capitals of Ghana, Guinea, Mali, and Morocco was established, with a layover in Belgrade. 1962 was highlighted by an unprecedented African tour. The aforementioned countries were paid visit by Politburo veteran Anastas Mikoyan. Today, the purpose of establishing close relations with Africa is quite obvious. 
We were looking to fill the void that developed after the collapse of colonial empires and to undermine American, British and French imperialism. Plus there was the simple enthusiasm of the matter, as in finally things are going our way, though back then nobody knew the cost of us having our way. In the late 70s it became apparent that economic aid for developing countries was costing the Soviet Union 23 billion each year, which was more than the entire rest of the world was allocating. Meanwhile, Vologda province remained almost as impoverished as Africa. Later in the 90s, we started actively pulling out of Africa. We left as ridiculously as we came, without leaving any sort of concessions or outposts and refusing to collect any debt. While the hunters were loading their rifles, In 1962 marked the big stage debut of that time's most prominent idol. His performance on the show A Decade of Azerbaijani Culture in Moscow made 20-year-old Muslim Magomayev an immediate fan favorite. Aside from the Buchenwald alarm bell, this newcomer sang Neapolitan songs, opera songs, as well as Russian and foreign smash hits. His vast repertoire would soon form a full concert program, to suit the taste of anybody and everybody who was united in their love towards Magomayev. A song by Lennon and McCartney called Yesterday. The entire country was swooning over his looks, his voice, the temperament of this fiery brunette, his swanky tuxedos, and his singing in Italian and English, while he accompanied himself on the piano. Magomayev was considered the country's most famous singer, a sex symbol and a trendsetter. In 1962, the first River C-class hydrofoil ship was built. This hydrofoil boat was named Kameta. It could reach a speed of 43 miles an hour. This new ship quickly became a staple at luxurious resorts. Trips out onto sea were a fantastic way to spend leisure time. It took a mere two and a half hours for these Kametas to make it from Sachi to Sukhumi. In the fall of 1962, the first articles on contemporary Soviet abstractionists were published in Western media. Artists would tend to showcase their work among their own, but after extensive media coverage, they would be urged to take part in the exhibition honoring the 30th birthday of the Artists' Union's Moscow subdivision being held at the Manage. Soon the exhibition would be visited by Soviet leadership. Khrushchev said that the work was shit, while calling the creators faggots. He ordered to banish all members of the Artists' Union from the Union and all party members from the party. It turned out there was almost no one to expel from either. In two weeks' time a meeting was held between state leaders and intellectuals to raise the issue of eradicating abstractionism and formalism. A war was declared on art, which had nothing in common with real life. Artists were being fed by the people, their training was funded by the people, so they were obligated to work in the name of the people. Who were they working for if the people couldn't understand them? The United States finally sent their first astronaut into space. During a five-hour flight, Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn almost circumnavigated the Earth three times in the Mercury spaceship, afterwards splashing down into the Pacific Ocean. This news story attracted plenty of attention. The fact that Glenn was only third after Gagarin and Titov was quite flattering, and the US sending their own into space, albeit a bit late, confirmed that we were on the right path. Glenn was significantly older than our boys and looked considerably less heroic. Also, it was quite bewildering to see America splashing their return capsule into the water, instead of doing things properly and directing it to solid ground like we did. In 1962, purchase prices were increased for livestock products, which resulted in an increase in retail prices for meat, butter and milk. 
On average, prices grew by 30%. Butter prices were increased by 35%, while beef, the primary type of meat, became 31% more expensive. The new price was 2 rubles per kilo as opposed to 150. Up until that point in post-war Soviet history, prices would tend to decrease, at least nominally. It was announced that these measures were aimed at stimulating the farming industry. In essence, the socialist industrialization was all about seizing a vast amount of resources from rural settlements and redirecting them in the name of supporting heavy industry. This was the key factor in the rapid economic growth of the 1930s and the 1950s. But everything comes at a price. In this case, the trade-off was ruining the village and subjecting it to a chronic state of crisis. Towards the end of the 1950s, it became all the more apparent that there was nothing more you could squeeze out of the village. On the contrary, it was in dire need of resources, which would most likely be utilized inefficiently anyway. The initial reaction of the Soviet government, upon encountering these issues, was to drastically increase food prices for the first time since 1947. In 1962, youth radio station first started broadcasting. Their first program was quite successful. Plenty of people sent in letters, which were addressed by journalists. Youth radio station would address its listeners with the words, let us work together, rapidly growing its pool of freelance and military correspondents. The station's programs would be constructed around a dialogue with the audience. Youth would be the first to utilize live interviews, refusing to write out the script in advance. Copyrighted songs would be broadcast to a large audience through youth, and almost all of the bards were on the station's roster. Songs and letters, songs based on letters, and letters about songs. And talk about youth's field mail. One of the station's founders was Yuri Visber, who wasn't inclined to separate bards from journalists. Here's a fragment of the Little Light TV program with Visber performing the featured song. Yuri writes the song himself. His characters provide the documentary background noise. In conjunction, this makes for a unique reporting genre that's unlike anything else. So I just got back from Tiumen about a week ago. And while I was there, I wrote a song. About Siberia and Siberians. Are you familiar with the land? I think you are, actually. Who does the house belong to? It looks like common property. Back then, Nikita Sergeyevich was the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine. The aforementioned increase in meat, butter and milk prices shocked the nation. Anti-Soviet speeches and pamphlets were reported in Moscow, Tambov, Tbilisi, Novosibirsk, Chelyabinsk and Gorky. But the most vocal protests were observed in the Don region, in former Cossack capital Novocherkask. At the local electric locomotive factory, that increase in prices coincided with a decrease in rates. A spontaneous meeting occurred. The workers ousted the factory's director, as well as the first secretary of Rostov's regional Communist Party committee who arrived at the scene. They trashed the factory administration and decided to make their way to the city center the next day. That evening, tanks and troops were sent to Novocherkask. The next morning, a group consisting of six members of the Presidium of the Central Committee flew in from Moscow. Located in that valley is the Novocherkask electric locomotive plant named after Budyonov, as well as the electrode and oil industry machine plants. En route to the city center, across the bridge over the Tuzlov River, the workers overcame three blockades consisting of tanks, trucks and soldiers. Those up front were carrying a portrait of Lenin and some fresh flowers. According to the KGB report, lathe operator Chernik came forth with a provocative statement which went, we want meat, milk and a raise. Upon making it to the city center, a portion of the workers broke into the town committee building. There was a group of soldiers at the square. Nobody knew what to do. And when shots were fired, at first people thought that the soldiers were shooting into the air. Platov's Ataman Palace, after that the town committee, then the town executive committee. When shots were fired, the workers, who had seized the building, had already made their way out. The square was completely occupied by a massive and rowdy mob. Nobody was expecting people to be gunned down in 1962. According to the KGB report, 
After the riot was suppressed, 20 bodies were retrieved in the aftermath. Subsequently, another seven people were given the death penalty. The allegations included slander directed at the Soviet democracy. The rest of the nation knew about what transpired in Novocherkask thanks to rumors about riots on account of meat prices, shots fired and even casualties. Meanwhile, the media was completely silent. The situation was discussed on local radio and at local party meetings. Five radio direction finders were sent to Rostov province in order to stop radio enthusiasts from sending messages to other countries. On September 1, 1962, the Bolshoi Theatre Ballet embarked on a three-month U.S. tour and a two-week tour around Canada. This tour turned out to be every bit as triumphant as the first tour in 1959. In 1959, Galina Ulanova was still prima, but by 1962 she had already retired. Despite her having a bunch of relatives abroad, her immature political stance, and despite her audacious words and actions, lead ballerina Maya Plisetska was still appointed as the Bolshoi's official prima. Our media happily recites the title Queen of Soviet Ballet, as she was dubbed by American reviewers. We'll do everything we can to show the Americans the very best our culture has to offer. 150 years had passed since no wonder everyone in Russia still remembers that day at Borodino. Since then a ceremony has been held each year at Borodino Field on September 9th. In honor of the anniversary, a Battle of Borodino Museum panorama was opened in a specially constructed building on Kutuzovsky Prospect. This soon became one of the most frequently visited attractions in the whole of Moscow. The largest panorama in the world was created by France Roubaix in the year 1912, honoring the centennial of the Battle of Borodino, though it wouldn't be put on display for quite a while due to a lack of an appropriate venue. 1962 enriched Soviet folklore with an image of a record holder with wicked charm. He appeared in the film Hussar Ballad, which was produced in honor of the 150th anniversary of the Patriotic War of 1812. Our country was in dire need of an indecent hero, since we already had plenty of decent heroes. Stories had already existed beforehand about a nameless hussar who saved the ladies from fire and immediately turned the heat up a notch. This hero was given a name by Mosfilm Studio, director Ildar Ryazanov, and actor Yuri Yakovlev. Lieutenant Ruzhevsky, with his spurs rattling, all of a sudden becomes a household name in Russia. Lieutenant Ruzhevsky! That's him. It was this guy. He drank like a coachman. He fought like a demon. He fancied himself a pretty lady, and he couldn't stand the thought of matrimony. My brigadier uncle decided to find me a wife. That was the most horrible day of my life. With his overall personality preserved, Ruzhevsky would be portrayed as tremendously vulgar. A unique decree was published in newspapers. The title Hero of Socialist Labor was bestowed upon 26 unnamed scientists and engineers. Though at least their achievements were clearly written out, developing new prototypes of high-power thermonuclear weapons. Implying Khrushchev's famous threats, it was said about this decree that it rewarded the creators of the Tsar bomb. In 1962, eight years after abolishing separate schools for boys and girls in the USSR, a film called But What If This Is Love hits theaters. The question was posed by six-time Stalin Prize-winning director Yuli Reisman. Immediately he received a response from two-time Stalin Prize-winning director Sergei Yudkevich in the form of an article titled But What If This Isn't Love? The girls and boys who went to school together for the first time only made it to the eighth grade, and the adults weren't prepared for their feelings for each other. The mother started yelling and slapped the girl right in front of everybody. How dare you! Get out of my way! What has gotten into you? She's a grown-up girl, Tanya. You should be ashamed of yourself. The woman with the pan expresses the neighborhood's petty opinion. This is outrageous. I'm not surprised. That's what a mother does. 
Who wants their daughter to become a slut? The well-respected teacher turns out to be a disgusting hypocrite. People all over the country were partaking in heated discussions on whether male and female Komsomol members can walk around holding hands in their free time. The magazine New World became something of a gospel to intellectuals. 1962 was the only year they published Soviet prison fiction. Issue 11, with personal approval from Khrushchev himself, featured a tale called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, written by a teacher from Ryazan named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. A very sensitive issue, an unsung hero, and an unshakable will to live. While he was incarcerated, he had to endure a good 3,653 such days, serving three extra days on account of leap years. This tale remained the pinnacle of freedom in the realm of print media. It would soon be republished in the novel newspaper and even receive a Lenin Prize nomination. Ivan Denisovich and the criticism department solidified the feud between the left-leaning New World and the conservative October magazine. In 1962, Mari Yamov, one of New World's editors, picked apart the latest work of October's editor-in-chief, Sevalit Kachetov, a novel titled Regional Committee Secretary. Some of the most notable pieces published in 1962 included Aitmatov's First Teacher, Bondarev's Silence, and Salinger's Laughing Man. Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev bestows a gold star medal upon Tatar Zhivkov. Nineteen sixty-two was the year when people learned the term hula hoop. Everybody was spinning these hollow rings around their waists. Kids were looking to show off their craftiness, while adults, women in particular, were hoping to lose weight. The foreign term didn't find its way into Russian dictionaries, and when female gymnasts would use a hula hoop, the latter would typically be identified as an obruch, which is Russian for hoop, despite an obruch being flat as opposed to a tubular hula hoop. In the 1960s, women were infatuated with hula hoops. It was much later on when they started practicing strict diets in order to lose weight. But in the moment, back in the 1960s, girls would tend to be a stout size 14, cheeks not sunken in and with some dimples, they'd have some bangs, a bit of eyeliner to get a slight slant going, and a robust body shape with a pronounced bust and hips. Only later down the line would fashion dictate a more androgenic shape, which is something I personally deeply regret. In the meantime, the hula hoop marked the beginning of a transition from those old standards of beauty towards what we have today, which require a lot of work in the gym and starving yourself senseless. Famous Russian composer Igor Stravinsky visited the USSR the same year he turned 80. He left Russia back in 1910, residing in the United States since 1939. Apparently the fact that he moved before the revolution served as a pardon for Stravinsky. Stravinsky's music hadn't been performed on his home soil for decades at that point. He was invited to Moscow by the Union of Soviet Composers, who rightfully considered Stravinsky's work to be alien. Concerts held in Moscow featured suites from classic ballets such as Petrushka and the Rite of Spring, as well as some decidedly traditional later pieces. They were massively successful. Exhausted from bowing, in the end Stravinsky would come out onto the scene in a trench coat, as if saying it's time to wrap this up. During the encore, maestro Stravinsky would orchestrate the song of the Volga Boatman. Little did the organizing party know that Stravinsky put together the orchestration of this folk song back in 1917, while participating in a contest announced by Kerensky to compose a new Russian national anthem. 1962 was the year Moscow's Ring Road was built. The 68-mile-long Moscow Ring Road was constructed around what was then the city border. In 1962, two airplanes, an AN-10 and an IL-18, successfully made the flight from Moscow to Antarctica for the first time after spending 50 hours airborne. This route connected the motherland with the polar research settlement Mirny. Antarctica and its penguin inhabitants all of a sudden became super popular. The name penguin was given to a hip cafe and the cake they served. Ball pens were produced shaped like penguins, as well as siphons for carbonated water and even colorful garbage cans on the streets. Meanwhile, penguins' musical talent and curiosity would become legendary. 
В Антарктиде льдины землю скрыли, Льдины в Антарктиде замела пурга. Здесь одни пингвины прежде жили, Ревниво охраняя свои снега. Ревниво охраняя свои снега. In the past, nobody lived there except for penguins. But that was before planes started flying between Antarctica and Moscow. When the cartoon Three Penguins first came out, the flightless birds started competing not only with the three little pigs, but also with the three bears. For a few years, the penguin was Russia's primary national animal. In October of 1962, Oleg Penkovsky was arrested in the center of Moscow. He was the most productive foreign agent who ever operated against the USSR. Military intelligence colonel Penkovsky shared information on Soviet rocket technology. For example, it was thanks to Penkovsky that the US found out that analysts were seriously overestimating the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal, as in the USSR wasn't on par with the United States in that respect. Penkovsky's case was the most sensational espionage investigation in all of Soviet history. During the final one and a half years of his activity, Penkovsky relayed 10,000 plus pages of secret documents to British and American intelligence on rocket specifications, launch pad locations, nuclear aviation and submarines. Twelve British and American diplomats plus one messenger posing as a merchant aided Penkovsky in his operation. Said merchant was later exchanged for a Soviet colonel. A movie called Dead Season was shot based on these events. Soviet newspapers didn't say a word about Penkovsky being an elite Soviet intelligence operative. Instead, he was designated as a responsible employee of the State Science and Engineering Committee. Pravda newspaper wrote that he not only studied Morse code, but also trendy moves from Western dances such as Twist and Charleston. Nothing was said about the reason for Penkovsky's incredibly comprehensive knowledge being his friendship with strategic rocket force commander Varensov. One public trial and multiple articles later, Penkovsky was given the death penalty. Concerning the defendant Penkovsky. Where do you even start to define the severity and heinousness of his crimes? Chief Marshal Varensov was discharged in the rank of Brigadier General. USSR Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev meeting with President Gamal Abdel Nasser. The defining international incident of 1962, and throughout the entire history of military confrontation between the world's two main superpowers, was the Cuban Missile Crisis. The US was putting more and more pressure on Cuba, harboring plans for overthrowing Castro, and irritating Khrushchev by placing their missiles near the Soviet border in Turkey. While on vacation in Bulgaria or Pitsunda, Khrushchev would jokingly say that those missiles, located on the other side of the Black Sea, were aimed squarely at him. After discussing matters with Castro, Operation Anadir was set into motion, with the intention of deploying Soviet tactical nuclear weapons on Cuba's territory. A contingent was sent to Cuba, prepared for two years of autonomous operation. 43,000 people, 42 nuclear warheads, a group of rocket boats, 72 planes, 172 tanks. Kennedy is informed on October 16th. A U-2 surveillance plane discovers nuclear missiles in Cuba capable of making it to Canada. The U.S. announces a blockade of Cuba. 180 ships with 85,000 soldiers on board surrounded the island. Troops in NATO member states were put on high alert. Warsaw Pact countries also had to resort to similar measures. The annual Soviet autumn demobilization had to be put on hiatus. The USSR's foreign affairs minister Gromyko, speaking to Kennedy personally, declares that U.S. aggression against Cuba would lead to an all-out war with the USSR, while denying there being any Soviet assault weapons on the island. On the morning of the 27th of October, a Soviet surface-to-air missile shoots down an American U-2 aircraft, killing the pilot. Air Force Command suggests to Kennedy that they should start bombing Soviet bases located in Cuba, and Castro urges the USSR to launch a preemptive missile attack. John Kennedy decides to wait for a few hours and conveys a final warning to Soviet Ambassador Dabrinin through his brother Robert, who was the Attorney General. 
Meanwhile in Moscow, the Soviet government, fearing to be too late to answer, openly broadcasts their message to US president over the radio. Soviet missiles will be removed from Cuba in exchange for withdrawing American missiles from Turkey while guaranteeing no aggressive actions against Cuba. Negotiations began between the two superpowers. The obvious reason for deploying Soviet missiles in Cuba was to at least create the illusion of being on par with the United States, in one swift motion. Apparently they were also hoping that Kennedy was weak and that he would fold under pressure. As most people see it, the situation resulted in the Soviet Union's loss, but that's not necessarily true. Cuba was guaranteed to not be invaded, American missiles were withdrawn from Turkey, and finally the elites on both sides had a good look into the abyss which is nuclear war, coming to the realization that it was time for a de-escalation. The process was interrupted by the Vietnam War, but it was underway, and it led into the years 1969 and 1970. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom. Mr. President, my question has not to do with Cuba, but rather with Castro. Castro wasn't informed about the decision to withdraw the Soviet missiles. Cuba wasn't invited to the negotiations concerning the situation. Afterwards, Mikoyan was sent over there to explain the situation, him being the main expert on sensitive affairs. The missiles were missing from Soviet territory for 106 days. A motorized infantry brigade was left stationed on Cuba, as well as anti-aircraft defenses and so on. And the rocket launcher that shot down the American surveillance plane was warshipped by the Cuban armed forces. The Cuban Missile Crisis implied deciding who plays first and second fiddle in the world between us and the United States. In true superpower fashion, we were waging battle around the globe. The entire world was within the scope of our interest. We brought our missiles to a tropical paradise, tried them in battle, and left some strict guidelines for the Cubans. When activating the device, pull the lock handle out and simultaneously pull the control lever to the left. Meanwhile in the West, during the peak days of the crisis, the situation was clear as day. The US started evacuating its large cities. However, in the Soviet Union, only elite government officials from Moscow knew what was really going on. And even they didn't go any further than relocating their families to the countryside. It took them a while to realize that this two-week balancing act might have escalated into a new world war. The USSR's actions were described internally as strictly defensive, as in we were looking out for our little brother. The US's reaction was presented as totally inadequate, them getting hysterical over a false Soviet threat. Terms such as American militarism, the Pentagon and its hawks became quite common. An excerpt from a contemporary piece written by Sergei Mikhokov. Generals of Pentagon keep talking about defense. But who are they really protecting themselves against? If it's us they fear, picking fights doesn't make sense. We've already got our hands full. Our generals are concerned about defense. The word caught on in the Russian language. And soon people were calling any large administrative building a Pentagon. Typically the ones belonging to regional party committees. A couple of stage singers with foreign surnames had a few things in common, namely official recognition and widespread popularity. Both sang city songs about women's happiness. Up until that moment, stories about women's hardship were usually said in the village. Leningrad resident of Polish descent Edita Piecha was the first person to sing on behalf of pretentious women. Her lyrical heroine did, beyond a doubt, have a college diploma. Piecha was the first person in the USSR to remove the microphone from its stand and walk around the stage singing. Her mannerisms and ever-present accent were considered the gold standard of sophistication. Against the wind my song echoes like a scream. If you're a creation of my own device, then be just like you are in my dreams. Yeah. 
Maya Kristalinskaya's image was of a simpler woman, whose dreams actually did come true. During her concert for those participating in the November 1962 Communist Party Central Committee plenary meeting, she performed her smash hit Moscow Province Town, that really resonated with most unmarried weavers. That's just the way it happened, he wrote me a letter and the girls didn't know any better than to present pier glass as a housewarming gift. In 1962, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Soviet physicist Lev Davidovich Landau. He received the prize for his fundamental theories of condensed matter, particularly liquid helium. Experiments with liquid helium allowed for discovering entirely new properties of matter at ultra-low temperatures, superthermal conductivity, superconductivity and superfluidity. The great physicist received his medal and diploma, just like every other Nobel Prize winner, on December 10th, but not in Stockholm, but in a hospital at Leninsky Prospect in Moscow, from the Swedish ambassador. Two years prior, Landau got into a gnarly car accident. We've just covered 1962 in another episode of The Other Day, 1961 to 1991, current era. After that comes 1963. Highlights include the Friendship Oil Pipeline, Tereshkova's flight and wedding, Kennedy's assassination, the first purchase of foreign grain, Bologna cloaks, Yashin the world's best goalie, the song Meanwhile in Our Yard, and Discord with China. See you next episode and next year.